Hello and welcome to the 317th episode of the Board Game Barrage podcast, a podcast about board games, the latest hotness, how to have fun with your friends. Even when you're losing, I'm joined by Neelan, the head honcho. Hello. <laughs> and Mark, uh, who doesn't have a title. Mark, Untitled. <laughs> you got to have a title. You've been an entrepreneur for too long. Entrepreneur is not a title. You understand? No, I'm going untitled. <laughs> it's gonna be a self-titled right. album. You're back though. I am, okay. I'm back. It's been too. They long. tried to get me. <laughs> you know what I mean? COVID uh-huh. tried to come for me. Couldn't take me. Okay. Many cities. Many voyages. Many planes. Okay. Uh-huh. I, I listen. I'm Premier Platinum now. Last time we checked in, I was a couple <laughs> levels below. I'm not lying to you. This is you real. That, that airline status. Boarding group it. one. My friend. Wow. Think wow. about that. And that's not a humble brag, than one. it's just a brag. <laughs> Today on the 317th episode of the Board Game Brush podcast, we are bringing back the draft, and in that draft, someone will win hundreds of dollars. I can't remember what we're up to. We I, keep I, I doubling. think it's a hundred dollars. Yeah, we're not at hundreds of dollars. At no, all. we just keep doubling it. No, Every time we keep doubling it. Yeah. We, is, we that, is this keep... like the would you rather have a million dollars with one penny doubled for like a year? <laughs> and, no, and it's screwed. like, have you seen that? It's like, here, do you want a cookie or do you want me to give the next person two cookies? <laughs> that's what I'm talking then, about. Yeah. No. Yeah, we're that's doing what one we're cookie. doing. We're uh, doing one cookie. We're not oh, doubling one cookies. cookie. Yeah. All right. Well, someone's going to win $100. And that someone is whoever votes on their list of the five games that they consider to be the most overrated. That's right. We'll be drafting our top five most overrated games each. And you might think that that's negative, but we consider that a positive. Avoid the landmines that we have mined. No, stepped on. (laughs) But before we do that, we're going to talk about the games that we have been playing. Neilan is going to start us off with Undaunted 2200 Callisto Protocol Nope, not game. protocol, but sure. Oh, there's no protocol. No protocol. I will okay. I will be talking <laughs> but but I will be talking about the nature board game Kickstarter nature that's on it's really hard to get to this page because you're like nature board game Kickstarter. Nature, the evolution of evolution, <laughs> evolution one, evolution two point <laughs> oh, nature, board game Kickstarter, and Mark will take us home to his homeland, Barcelona. Barcelona, please. <laughs> I won't be saying that, <laughs> and it's also not your homeland, and how dare you attempt to... What do they call that? Appropriate, what do you call uh, that when someone... Uh, yeah, appropriating others' culture, Mark. That's what I'm... you're always known for. <laughs> that is true. Do you think, you think you, you're allowed in Trader Joe's? <laughs> First I don't know. Egypt, now Spain. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, I'll stop talking. I'm on too much sugar-free, caffeine-free Coca-Cola right now. <laughs> Neon, why don't you take us to space? Yeah. Why don't you take us to space? Let's go undaunted to space. Undaunted 2200. Uh, undaunted 2200 okay, Callisto. Neon, haven't we undaunted a lot? Oh, we have undaunted a lot. And that's funny. Like we undaunted in, in the past. We've undaunted yeah. in the present. Now yeah. The... Yeah. And to some extent, like that's actually pretty funny because I can't think of a way to open this segment except by saying yes i've explained the rules of undaunted a lot and largely this is another one of those so i I think i will probably not belabor the entirety of the rules explanation of this you know if you want to get a crack course in how undaunted works please listen back to any previous coverage of the other games Uh, undaunted 2200 callisto though is another iteration in the franchise by trevor benjamin david thompson and osprey games this is a sci-fi game and i should say right off the bat that this was sent to us by osprey games as a review copy so undaunted callisto is a sci-fi iteration so these games have up until now all been set on or adjacent to world war ii which to me this is a step up thematically. I am very happy to sort of be well away from World War II, a theme I don't care for at all, into sci-fi land. We're talking about mechs. Well, it talking... happened, Neilan. What happened? You don't... Do you really want all of this? Because there's a no. lot that happened. What I'm saying is World War II is not a theme, Neilan. It's a f***ing event. It actually well, happened. I mean, this is this is a future event. This is, if anything, like a warning. You know, like this oh, is Brent. what could be happening <laughs> in the dark future where we've colonized the moons of Jupiter. A conglomerate, this is capitalism, Kellen. This is a capitalistic conglomeration. Uh, yeah. They're taking our ice. 
They're taking our ice? <laughs> that's the, what? That's the premise. Oh, my God. Ice. Ice well, is the commodity. You're mining the ice from the moons of Jupiter? The, exactly. Our what were you going to put in your diet-free, sugar-free Coca-Cola, Callan, if not ice from the planet or Jupiter's moon, Callista? Let me tell you this. I wish I had ice tonight. <laughs> <laughs> So do the people of the deep, grim, dark future, which is why <laughs> the breakers rebel. They want to reclaim the ice that they have been mining from the planet. So these are the two factions in the game. Undaunted is ostensibly like a war game abstraction. You, you have troops moving around a map. You have this novel card system I love where every round opens for bidding for initiative. And then depending on who plays the higher initiative, you play out the remainder of the cards in your hand in order to move troops around the map, take shots, etc., etc., etc. It is a hybrid deck builder slash war game because what is one of the biggest strategic considerations in this is whenever you bolster your cards, which cards are you going to put in your deck? Are you going to add more action cards for this squad? Are you going to more add more action cards for your mech? And some of the things that are quite interesting about Undaunted is that these mechs in particular are kind of a new unit type where you could actually build each mech in one of a handful of different ways. You can put more gunners into your mech. So that's one unit that has now different cards associated with it, which is a pretty neat change. Let's get into the fundamental changes that Callisto offers that are different from the previous Undaunted games. The first thing is that all of these scenarios, and this is back to the scenario structure that is more similar to people that have not played Stalingrad. This is not a campaign game necessarily. These scenarios are pretty freeform, although there is a logical flow to the storyline of them. So if you want to play them in order, that would probably be preferable. Each of these is represented by a bespoke printed cardboard map. What's crazy about that is then when you open the box for the first time, you just get this hunk of cardboard that is just four double-sided boards that you fold out for each of the scenarios, or I think maybe four or five double-sided boards that you fold out for each of the scenarios. Each one just a very bespoke map for that scenario, which is kind of crazy. It feels a little bit wasteful to me, but at the same time, it does offload the setup problem that Undaunted sometimes has, where you're collecting tiles and arranging them in a special arrangement for each of the things. The thing that's a kind of a nice boon about this is all the setup you need are printed on the map so if you, all the starting positions for all the tokens will appear on that map although i should say this is very quick pet peeve there are some misprints at least in the edition i got i don't know if this will be corrected for later print runs but the board does not always contain the most accurate information relative to the scenario book so that's kind of a bummer anyway one of the other things i think is quite a cool change is there is quite a bit of asymmetry between the two factions in most of the Undaunted games, with the exception of Stalingrad and, and perhaps some of the other ones I haven't played, in most of the Undaunted games, there is a pretty good correlation between the two factions. If you have scouts, they have scouts. If you have riflemen, they have riflemen. If you have shotgunners, they have shotgunners. In Undaunted Callisto, there is quite a fair bit of asymmetry. Only one side has these mechs. There are variances even between the correlating unit types. So what would be your rifleman in a typical game of Undaunted, one unit version of the rifleman have slightly different stats they might be better at close quarters versus the other factions which has a slightly different scouting ability or something to that effect so there are quite substantial differences between the way that each of these sides plays in ways that does start to make each of them feel pretty unique in terms of what their strengths and weaknesses are, are which i thought was really cool some new mechanics come into play. You have elevation for the first time. And this actually ends up being one of the more significant changes where you have sections of the map that are effectively hills or towers. And if you are shooting down in another unit, you're going to roll a slightly better die versus the normal standard undaunted D10. You're going to be rolling a D12, which increases your odds. And conversely, if you're shooting upwards to people that are on higher elevation from you, you're rolling a weaker die, a D8. So there's a lot of important considerations based on your relative positioning on these maps. The maps in general kind of feel a lot more constrained. You tend to get into close quarters very quickly, less kind of just sniping at people from one side of the map to the other. So it ends up feeling quite substantially different from regular Undaunted in a way that I kind of really dug. Like now having played a lot of these games, the question does become, okay, what makes this one different? What makes this one unique? And it did feel quite a lot different. This actually kind of felt a lot closer to what I remember about the sort of the melee en masse of something like a Warhammer, where you're just rushing these troops at each other, they're getting into close quarters combat and just like tearing each other apart. It felt really, really cool. 
I do want to get into some of the downsides of all of this, which is to say that because of this mess of now units all having unique names, setup and teardown for this game is such a huge bear. For each of the factions, you're going down this list of uniquely named units because you no longer have the benefit of just saying riflemen for one side versus the other. You now have your uniquely named units, their uniquely named units, two different variations, each of which gets split into two different forces at two different deployment zones. It's really kind of a nightmare to set up and tear down in a way that is kind of exhausting, if you're, especially if you're playing multiple games back to back. But yeah, overall, though, I would say that my feelings on this are quite positive. Like, I, I think that the theme worked really well for me. I think it settles into a kind of an awkward space, though, where I'm not convinced this is necessarily the game that I would say, hey, if you've never played Undaunted before, dive in on this one, because there it does feel a little bit like, hey, this is the deep end of the Undaunted system. At the same time, it feels like the most natural entry point, because it is kind of like a soft reboot for the franchise. So it's kind of awkwardly positioned, where it's not quite serving as one thing or the other i still think if you've ever been curious about the undaunted series this would be a good one to try especially if the theme speaks to you but just know that you're coming in into it at its most obtuse to some extent and it's most sort of overbearing the art's cool yeah the art's great i was going to ask about is this a good introduction but you've sort of answered that but you mentioned that this seems to be more focused on close combat is that what you're saying like in general I don't know if necessarily close combat is exactly how I describe it, but it, it did seem to me like you tended to be all up in each other's grills much yeah. quicker. Some of that might have been like just a repeated function of the games I play, that that just sure. happening over again. We might have been yeah. playing badly. I don't know. But right. it did seem like that just happened more and more than I was used to in Undaunted. So with that caveat that you may not have seen like everything the game has to offer, do you think that the game playing in the way that it did does it lose something in that like is this less undaunted than the other undaunted does it feel like whatever was quote-unquote undaunted it has moved away from that a little bit or is this still have the spirit of undaunted (laughs) i i didn't think that personally like it still felt very solidly like to me undaunted is the brilliance of the initiative system and the action set system and you know like that trade-off of i'm gonna risk going first or not going first in order to like try and potentially take cards out of my opponent's hand versus lose those opportunities like to me that's 80 percent of what undaunted is and that's yeah. still pre- perfectly preserved gotcha. here it okay. ends up just feeling slightly different but i also to be fair like every undaunted game feels pretty different from every other undaunted sure. games which, which yeah. is one of the things i've been most impressed by this franchise in general they find ways to reinvent it that make it feel like hey you're familiar with like 80 percent of the rules of this game but here are the subtle ways that we're going to make this feel like a slightly different experience gotcha so in, in that sense i would say that it still is undaunted like through and through for me so yeah that is undaunted 2200 callisto by osprey games So now we go from the distant future where we're all fighting over ice back to the brilliance of our homeland now and the beauty of nature. You know what I mean? Absolutely. I do. Okay, good. Yeah, you both. With Neil and you don't go outside, so. No, that's true. That's fair. Okay. Nature is a game that is currently on Kickstarter. So as this releases, there are a couple more weeks this is designed by North Star Games, and it is in the same line or universe as the Evolution series uh, of games. So there was Evolution, a top 50 board game for me of all time for many years. There was Oceans, a game that took that game to the ocean and introduced the Deep, which was a bunch of crazy card powers and like one-off cards. And then now Nature, very clearly an Evolution 2.0 or an attempt at an Evolution 2.0. I feel like I'm an evolution 2.0 I, in some ways. <laughs> yeah. That is how we, we think of it. I already feel connected to this game in a lot of ways. Yeah. Evolution was a CCG-like game where you were creating species. They were increasing in size and population. They were eating from a shared water well of resources. And then they were turning into predators and eating each other when they ran out of food at the water well. And that, that was the game. And everything I just said, I believe also 1 million percent applies one-to-one with nature. You are creating species, you have a watering hole, you're feeding them, you can turn them into predators if you want, but you're also looking at these traits and you're sort of saying, I want to be corned 
which means that if someone bites into me, they will also get hurt in that process. So a little defense, right? You could add some claws that make it so you're a little bit stronger. You could become a scavenger that when someone else hunts, you eat no matter what. So this sort of ecosystem that exists around all of the animals. But what nature does, uh, what nature does is it shaves off some of the sort of pointy ends. In evolution, you could make new species whenever you wanted. In nature, everyone is making one new species per turn. In evolution, it could be Neelan's first game, and I could turn all my people into predators on the first turn and eat all of Neelan's animals. And Neelan would say, what do I do, Kellen? And I would say, get good at the game, Neelan. All your species are dead. In nature, that's been sort of walked back. So Neelan can still get eaten, but then whatever Neelan loses will get added to the species that he makes in the next round. So it'll come into the game stronger and bigger and larger, and those trait cards will go back into your hand. So everything you lose, you can sort of re-put out on the board. It's all been done to make the game more accessible, more open to new players, the artwork has been completely redone. I would say that for me, the artwork feels a lot like Cascadia. It feels like all the nature games we're seeing. The uh, front cover is really, really beautiful, and, and the components are really interesting. I'm not sure the card art is an upgrade for me. There was something psychedelic and technicolor about the original set of traits that I really liked versus this new set. But all of that to bury the lead that I am, unfortunately, pretty disappointed in nature as a system. Maybe that's unfair, and maybe I should have known that going in, but the game is explicitly designed to be more welcoming and open to new players to reduce friction of getting into that system, and then it offloads any sort of newness to modules, right? So Evolution had expansions. It had flight, it had climate, you know, where you could be fighting the climate. Here, they have added modules, flight, a module, Arctic Tundra, Amazon Rainforest, Jurassic... And literally each module has sort of a thing like, do you want less conflict in your game? Play flight and be a coward and you can fly away and go to a different watering hole. You know, do you want to fight more and have big monsters? Add Jurassic to your game, right? Which has new trait cards. And there are five of these, like the Natural Disasters one, four players who love games that create stories. So that adds a, a literal random event deck to the game. For me, I hate modules. I'm on record. I just hate them I because it's like, what way should I play this game? And I'm not convinced that the base nature game is enough without modules. There are actually only nine trait cards, I believe, nine-ish trait cards in the game versus like Evolution, which had 15 to like 20 of them. And so that sort of CCG feeling of like, I'm going to combine flying with horned, you know, and Neelon has never seen a flying horned species that's going to come and eat all of his animals before you don't get as much of that because there's just less variety in the cards unless you're willing to play with all these modules. You can see why it's this way. I think that there's a lovely intention here to support a game system that they're sort of committed to creating new modules that will come out year over year. Again, I don't personally like modules. Christine and I have played the base game. There's a digital implementation where you can actually play with a couple modules. So I've played a couple games of the sort of base plus Jurassic, which I feel like would be me that I would like the most. I legitimately want to be more excited about nature. I want to be sitting here saying, oh my God, you know, but I think some of the spikiness and fun and oddities that evolution presented when I first played it have been sort of sanded off and sort of said, those were the problems with evolution, son. And like, this feels like some weird middle ground where it's again, trying to go after that, like, Nature games are lit now. Everybody wants nature, you know, wingspan, like like Cascadia, like oh, we got we got nature. And uh, it's tough, man. It's really tough. I, I like I don't want to oversell how disappointed I am in this. It's just my willingness to engage with the system is a lot lower than I expected and I was hyped to go into this one. And again, I also didn't like oceans for that matter and like many people also like that one so for me evolution and evolution climate sort of represented like this weird pseudo ccg like game where you were creating animal species that felt really novel to me and i just feel like we've taken a step away from that novelty because now it just feels a little bit more same samey to me 
I'm curious to dig into like aside from the idea of like modular games themselves. Like you know, let, let's say you had ten modules in a box, and that that was the game. Like that that in itself, as I understand, is distasteful to you. But like, I'm curious also because like they describe their model going forward as being like you know they're going to support this game for a decade. They're going to have a module or two every single year. To me, that kind of sets up alarm bells in the most cynical way of trying to capitalize on like a a long-term real in type philosophy. Does that worry you as well? Or like, does that just seem like the most natural way to go with something like this? I think that this company has the best intentions in the world. Like I, like I legitimately like, like part of why it pains me. I think this is like his baby. And like, this is the real, real of the system. I just don't like, like, like for me, I don't find like the fun of dominion is not, oh, we're going to use the Rising Sun cards with the Alchemy cards this time and see mm. what that does. Like, like, it's not just that for me. I think that part of this is you can add up to two modules per each game. So they're like, what would happen if we did Jurassic Flight? You mm-hmm. know, what would happen if we did Arctic Tundra with the natural disasters? And like that sort of exploratory... It feels much thinner to me for whatever reason as like a human being. It's just not the type of discovery that I personally care about. And I would rather play 10 different games that are more uh, honed as an experience. Yeah. Again, I don't know. I see it as like evolution hit and we've lost the plot and it was always going to be a little bit more niche. And like, that's fun for what it is. And like evolution Climate is still a game I own, and it, like it's only fallen off my top 50 by virtue of just, I don't know, not having played it as much in the last few years. And so my closing thoughts on Nature, which is a game I do want people to look at, is like huge respect to North Star Games. You can play this game as a digital trial on the Kickstarter page with the That's base, cool. with three modules, and you could play pass and play, or you can play local play, like Neil and Mark, we could start up a game. And I'd be happy to, just to feel it. But you have 15 more days to check out this game. I'd encourage everyone to do that. We'll leave a link to the Nature Kickstarter in the show notes. A really interesting system and one that does feel pretty unique, all all things considered. The animal theme is not just pasted on. Like, this is really like, if your population is bigger than the other population, you know, there's a lot going on. If you don't feed them, you're losing people and you go extinct. So there's... There's some really fun thematic elements incorporated here. That is Nature by North Star Games, currently on Kickstarter. And like you said, nature games are lit. You can put that on the box. I didn't say that. You did you say that. put that on the Kickstarter. <laughs> did I say that? You did say that. You did say that. So it came out of your That's mouth. the Coke Zero Sugar talking. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't me. But now from nature, right? Space. Yep. You know, now very expansive. Now yep. nature. Right, mm-hmm. and now we're going to a specific geographical location. Now nature has you evolved. Want me to... wah, wah. Na- <laughs> nature has evolved, and now we are people wah, building cit- wah. cities. <laughs> All right. So on the next course of nature, I got a chance to play Barcelona, a game that I've had for a little while, but didn't really feel myself drawn to getting to the table until I saw a lot of positive comments about it on our Discord from a number of listeners, especially Chea, who's a stalwart in our Discord. And so when it came time to propose a game for a game night, we decided to give it a spin. Barcelona is a game about rebuilding and expand sorry, about the rebuilding and expansion of Barcelona in the late eighteen sixties, and you'll be acting as planners trying to do so. It is designed by Danny Garcia, who's had a spate of games just released, including Arborea and Windmill Valley, and who appears to have a handful more on the horizon. So the way Barcelona works is you'll be presented by an unbuilt grid of the city of Barcelona to start the game. And on your turn, you're going to place two citizen tokens from your hand into any intersection of the city. Each row and column, and some diagonals actually, all have actions assigned to them. So whenever you place your citizens, you're going to look at the action associated with the row and the column, and maybe the diagonal of where you place them. Uh, What are the actions? Well, they're all pretty simple, but there are a number of them. So you can gain coins or cloth. That's one of the actions. Those are the two resources of the game. You can place cobblestones from your personal board to the shared cobblestone board, which are going to give you an instant benefit while also opening up space to store more of that golden cloth. 
You can place a roads, which are going to give you points and escalating points if you connect them to pre-existing roads. You can place intersections, which are going to give you income if people place their tokens later in the game on those intersection spaces in the future. You can take a project token, which is a personal end game scoring just for you. You can take an, uh, an action to increase the multiplier of one of those personal end game scorings. You can get a public service building, which is basically a handful of immediate benefits. You can move your little train, which is another a piece you'll have uh, around the city, which lets you drop off passengers, which gives you points and gives you the ability to take another action. And finally, you can move up the Serta track, which is named for the historical chief architect of Barcelona, which is a end of round goal multiplayer. More on that a little bit later. But those are the actions that you can do. So there are, there are many of them, but they're all pretty simple to understand on their own. After you've taken those actions, you'll see if any of the blocks in the city uh, are now surrounded by the prerequisite citizens needed to build a building. This is going to be based on the number of citizens that surround a block and potentially the color of the citizen tokens, which is why you're always going to have two citizens in your hand. You're always going to place those two citizens to start your turn, and the order you place them in is going to be part of the strategy in terms of like what buildings you're going to be trying to build. If you are able to build a building to end your turn, you're going to go ahead and place the building down on the map and move the citizen tokens that were the requirements for that building to this bottom track, which amounts to the game timer. So you'll be filling that up as more and build, more buildings get built. Speaking of, this track uh, is broken up into three main sections. And whenever one part, one of the three parts of the sections, is filled up, you're going to score that section's public goal, this public shared goal that everybody's going after. It may be the most roads, it may be something, some aspect of the game. There'll be a public scoring for it at the end of every third of the game. And here's where moving up that Serta track I mentioned earlier matters because the higher up you're on that track, the bigger multiplier you have on these end of round scorings that everybody is going after. Uh, you're going to do that until you fill up all three parts of the track and then the game ends. So that's how you play Barcelona. What's it like to play Barcelona? Well, this might be already apparent, but it is absolutely a point salad. Just about every action will lead directly to points and sometimes indirectly to points on top of points as more and more things start to cascade as the game progresses. This is also fairly heavy for a Euro point salad, but nevertheless quite smooth in my experience. The mental load doesn't really come from the intricacies of any one action or any action since they're on their own fairly straightforward, but it comes from First, remembering what all the actions do, because that can be a little bit daunting to start the game when you have all these options to choose from. And then also it comes from deciding which combination of two actions, which intersection that is, is the best one to choose to get those points uh, cascading. I also so, so appreciate that for as euro as it is, there is a level of interactivity that's not just from racing to get something before your opponent does. It's, Mark, let me ask you this. Okay. Is there the mental load looking at your player board or is that looking in the middle of the table? At which point do you experience the full mental load? Mental load. I would Barcelona? say there are a lot of loads to take on in this game. Okay. I would yeah. say the the biggest load is from the the shared board. The shared board is where you reach peaks peak mental load. Yeah, that's when your your mental load meter is going to be redlining, I would say. Got it. Okay. That's what I, that's that's my experience. Your experience may vary. Yeah, I think my looking at the cover might do it for me from a mental load <laughs> perspective. <laughs> but let's get back to that interactivity because I know you're a big fan of interactivity, <laughs> right, Kellen? That's so right. it's not just yeah, the let's interactivity. Get away from mental load. Yeah, exactly. There's not just the interactivity of like as you get in a lot of Euro games, just trying to get something before somebody else does. It's all it's like for example, it's often pretty lucrative to get a building built on your turn. You're gonna often want to make sure you get a building built because you can score points off of that. But that also means placing your citizen tokens in an intersection around where one of your opponents previously had placed theirs in order to get enough to, you know, meet the prerequisite for a building. But then there's a struggle of am I trying to do that to build a building, or is there a spot somewhere else on the board, which won't give me a building, but will give me the actions that I, I would rather do, you know, building points be damned. Also, the production, despite what Kellen says about the cover, is lovely. It's very colorful. Everything's good quality. My one super slight complaint is that, as again, Kellen's mentioned, everybody has a personal board full of these 
tokens and cubes and things that you're going to be removing and placing somewhere else and adding to your personal board and sliding around your personal board. And it would have been really, really nice if that board was recessed, but obviously that's quite a nitpick, but I think it would have helped quite a bit. As far as the game itself, I really enjoyed it, though I have to admit, I feel a little burnt out on Euros right now, and this didn't quite do enough to reverse that for me. It has a nice couple of touches of interaction, as I mentioned, but it is at its core very much a point salad. And I think that this is coming to me at a time where I'm just a little down on Euros in general. But I would say that if you're into Euros and you like big, chainy, heavy point salad type games, something like a Feld Plus, I would say, then Barcelona is an easy recommend. It feels very much like it's best in class, at least as far as the newer crop of games and, and Euro games go. Mark. Yes. Let me read you this review and I'll tell you. Can't wait. You tell me when I noped out. Okay. I greatly enjoyed exploring the history behind Barcelona now, while reading the now. rules and playing. You're out. Yeah, that's true. But let, okay. let me read at least two sentences. Okay. But you are sure. correct. You are 100% <laughs> okay. correct. I'm already yeah. gone. And I enjoyed the plethora of choices. I've seen comments against it being a point salad, but sometimes it's nice to have a gratuitously rewarding, colorful puzzle of a game out on oh, the table. Puzzle. Puzzle. You were way out of when you heard Well, puzzles. plethora got me. Uh, <laughs> point salad. Gratuitously rewarding. The history of Barcelona. Yeah. Uh, I actually thought I wanted to play this game until I read this review. So yeah, you did I don't, a good I don't job of hyping it. You. Yeah, I don't think it's like I like. I really like the cover, to be honest with you. Oh, yeah. I, I, I do. I, I had no, love the way that this looks. It triggers my mental load. Yeah. <laughs> That's something we're, we're careful to stay away from if possible. Anyways, Excuse that me? is... <laughs> Barcelona by Danny Garcia and published by Board and Dice. Let's get right into our featured topic, which is a draft. You can win $100 if you draft. No, you don't have to draft correctly. You just have to draft. That's Participate. One of you will win. Today, we're going to be drafting our top five most overrated board games ever. I know the word overrated is kind of contentious in board gaming, which... It's like, blah, blah, if it wasn't overrated, blah, blah, it's properly rated because people rated it. Anything to add to that amazing discussion on overrated <laughs> that I just started? <laughs> one, one thing I will I will agree with you, I don't know if this is what you're getting at, but I do dislike when people say, I don't think it's overrated, I don't think it's underrated, I think it's rated. I hate when, <laughs> when people say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I will say that there's a little bit of a concern, maybe concern is too strong a word, that this is going to be like a negative episode, but I don't think so because... I intend to defend the games that you guys pick. So I think we're going to be sure. like, this is going to be one uh, negative yeah, yeah. to two people positive. You know, no, so I think fair. this is going to be a good yeah. point. That's it's, it's, not, that couldn't be overrated. Yeah. So it's more positive. It'll actually be more positive Double, yeah. than a normal episode exactly, of the show. Exactly. Because normally one person is hyping and two people are trying <laughs> yeah, to say exactly. that was a terrible pick. Uh, if anything, that's actually the most really positive. funny. Yeah. What a good idea but so right. like what would you i mean do we want to talk about what are we considering what you would consider like a good pick or do we want to leave that sort of nebulous because you know there's something to be said for games that are very popular yeah they're, they're gonna lend themselves to be more overrated obviously i think the nature of the entire exercise is actually pretty interesting because it's like to be a good pick right it has to be overrated in the eyes of, of our audience right right and to some extent that's almost like where the entire premise of something being overrated breaks down is that it's only overrated to a subset of people obviously it's right. not overrated to the people that put it there in like the first most place. people will disagree with our picks probably exactly for each pick yeah for each pick yeah how hard did you guys find coming up with your your short lists it took me almost no effort at all oh really? do it live <laughs> okay <laughs> That's Neon's is funnier. Okay, and what is the order of our fight? Last time, I can't remember I what happened. DFL. Helen I won. That. Yep, I finished oh. last. S yeah, so Say Mark it again, would choose Neon. <laughs> Mark would Louder. first. Uh, no, quieter. Okay, so I think... <laughs> Whisper it. I, I think that I should... I'm not going to do this, but I should go first because it feels like first choice has been an advantage historically, mm. and I feel like I should have gone first I think last that's time. true. But I, this feels like such a difficult draft in terms of like what is good and what is not good that I'm just going to wimp out and wimp out and say I'm going to go second. Okay. Okay. I think it is so quite then, list dependent. So, so then, yeah. Neilan, do you want to go first? I'll go first. Why not? Yeah, I'll go first. And then that becomes Neilan, Mark, Callan, and I'm committed to getting the order right. 
All right. Well, some of this will be included. Yeah. Probably the yeah. parts where I told Neilan to whisper at me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because people will like, they'll ship yeah, that. Yeah, people like that. Fanfic. Exactly. You know, Neilan X Kellen. Yes. Well, what about Christina? I don't care. Whisper it to me, Neilan. <laughs> All right. Let us kickstart. Let us know. Let us start. We're not kickstarting anything yet. Let us start drafting the top overrated board games of all time definitive list de facto defined here on october the f- well we can't tell them when we record because mm-hmm. then yeah. they'll find out where we live exactly yeah they'll, they could dox us yeah, yeah, yeah. uh to overrated board games of all time we are going in the order set forth by the coward mark uh <laughs> it will start with neil the head honcho then mark the coward will draft then kellen the cmo big red himself that is the order so shall it do declare neil mark kellen Neilan, kick us off. What is the most overrated board game of yeah. all time? Yeah, it's it's funny actually because like I actually I came into this like thinking like I think I know what I'm going to pick first, but now I'm second guessing myself based on the premise of the question, right? Because is overrated worst? No, no, it is not worst. Over overrated. Okay, well, again, I know we're. <laughs> this is why people pay us. Yeah, you know, what I mean? <laughs> to be the ones to define this. But I would say the most overrated game would be the the Delta. Right, yeah. Delta. Mm-hmm. There's mm-hmm. a mental load between you know its rating, yeah, on Board Game Geek, or 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 even I guess we don't even have to use board. It's rating perceived quality. in the eyes of yeah. the world, yeah, in the eyes of the hobby, in the eyes of our listeners. The delta between that and then how good it actually yeah. is, as defined by you or as as our listeners also right and that's actually where i'm like now second guessing myself a little bit because you know it's tempting to say that anything in the top 100 is a good mark for something that's like considered yes. overrated but like i think a lot of these have already so much fallen out of favor from like public perception that considering them overrated would be a mistake oh no i wonder if i'm just talking <laughs> myself out of a good pick here <laughs> i have no idea even what you're thinking of picking to be honest with yeah you. Uh, that's funny. Okay. I'm going to, oh, I feel this feels like either like such a stupid pick now. I, I don't, I feel, oh no. I think in a lot of ways uh, you're going to be just, setting the tone for the rest of the draft. That's honestly. true. That yeah. True. I think that's kind of funny because it's like, yeah, now I feel very, very on the back foot, like having to pick first. I just want to say that this is why my strategy is perfect. Cause you're saying, <laughs> I'm it, not going and then first. I get to actually get the real first pick. Once yeah. The tone has been set. You react. Very nice. That, very nice. Yeah, very nice. The tenor. Right. I am going to go with <laughs> Nemesis. Okay. Okay. I Nemesis. think that Nemesis at number 21 is a game that has ridden very, very high on a very, very sm- relatively small number of people looking for a very specific experience that, in my estimation, does not align with our audience, which is to say that it is <laughs> quite Ameritrashy, it is quite random, quite silly, qu- not in the ways that we tend to like. It is almost like the worst possible version of a game like A Station Fall, where you kind of get these cool, wacky, immersive stories, but with none of the, for lack of a better word, strategic or tactical considerations, where almost everything that happens in the game is a result of lol random cards and or dice. So this wasn't on my short list, even though it's of the top 100 games, probably one that is would be least on my list. Probably m- might be like bottom five, because I just th- I think it, it offers something that other h- highly rated games or highly regarded games don't offer, which is the I'm going to play Alien the movie, the board game sort of thing. So that's why I kept it off my list, because I think it, it's something unique. I know I'm supposed to be saying, no, this isn't overrated, but I agree with Neil. <laughs> <laughs> well, so much for that. <laughs> Again, I, yeah, I mean, I think there's also something about the newness, right? Like, the closer a game is to 2024, the more there's, like, a hype reaction to sure. it. So, like, this is also, you know, it's not tried and true on this list like Puerto Rico is, you know, from 2002 or whatever. So that would make me inclined to believe that it is potentially more overrated. But again, more overrated in what context? In the eyes of our audience, the people voting. Yeah. That's all we care about is amassing Boats and Neilan has first picked Nemesis twenty two hundred Callisto Protocol. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually going to zig for my first pick. I'm going to put a game up there that wasn't even on my shortlist to start. But now that Neilan has set the tone, I've got a strike. 
So I am going to go with the 25th overall game on BGG, and that is Frosthaven, which is a game I think is only in the top 100. Not only, I shouldn't say that. Is in the top 100 primarily because it is a sequel to Gloomhaven. And whereas Gloomhaven was in game for me, I can definitely see why it was for a long time the number one game of all time uh, on the BGG top 100 list. I think Frosthaven was naturally always going to get there just because it's the sequel to that game. But I have not heard a lot of effusive praise of Frosthaven on its own. And I suspect it's it's there primarily because it's, you know, the successor to Gloomhaven and not on its own merits. So I will say Frosthaven is my first pick. I wonder if you've fallen into the trap of reacting trap. to my response to Frosthaven. <laughs> trap. Which I think is actually fairly counter to most people's impression of Frosthaven. Well, and this is all anecdotal, so who knows? He's talking to people on the street. (laughs) Yeah, I have talked to people on the street. I'm asking them what time it is. I'm asking them what they think about Frosthaven. No, I have spoken to some people who played Frosthaven because I know I'll never play it, and whenever somebody mentions it as a game they like, mentions it, whatever, we're talking about board games, I've asked them what they thought about it, and they seem to have said to me, and again, this is probably based on two or three other people that I've talked to, Mm -hmm. that it's like Gloomhaven, but with extra stuff that wasn't really better. You know, it just like, like like more but not better is yeah. what I've heard. And again, when Gloomhaven was all the rage, like you couldn't escape it. And it seemed like everybody was very effusive about it. And it was something that was new and different and, and evolution, to use the term we've been using in this episode, in the industry. And, and Frosthaven seems to have gone away in a much quieter way. But I don't know. I guess the votes will tell. Yeah, and you know, like I've already implied, that matches my personal feelings on Frosthaven, but I am very curious if that is the general audience's yeah. perception of it as well. We shall see. All right. I'm going to come in with my first pick. You, Yuck Vux, decided to start at rank 21, rank 25. I don't want to give you guys a new hope here, but I have <laughs> a very specific bugbear with people and the BGG Top 100. One of the easiest tells, the easiest tells of an overrated board game is when you attach an IP that people can't get out of their minds from when they were five years old. <laughs> do you know what I'm saying? I do know what you're saying. Am I touching something? You, you, you are. And remember, loyal listeners, even if you love the IP, even if you personally love the IP, That could also lead to it being overrated. Think about your love and how it's being exploited (laughs) by the ninth best board game, quote unquote, of all time, Star Wars Rebellion. Are you out of your mind? This game is like seven hours long and it tells the Star Wars tale perfectly. (laughs) Oh my God. We got got nine movies. Keep doing that. Keep I know. I, Star Wars. Listen, yeah, I, I, I I'm not. No, 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 no. Oh, you oh, make, what? No. T- <laughs> oh, what was you that? You like Star Wars? Listen, <laughs> really? You can, well, you can put Star on your robe with, with your midi chlorians. No, no, no. <laughs> oh, that sounds like a shot. L- that's not a shot. Okay. okay. Yeah, no, that sounded very menacing. Okay. You're helping the case here. This, it's like, look at, look at it. It's like. I have played about a quarter of a game of Star Wars Rebellion, and I just I cannot get over how clunky and how fantasy flight of a game this is. It's perfect for you if you love Star Wars, and if you don't, you should avoid it at all costs. And to put that in the top 10 board games of all time, frankly, it, it's sort of like making a list of the top 10 movies ever and then putting a bunch of f- Marvel movies in it. <laughs> like, let's just attack all of our darlings here. It's overrated. It's unquestionable. I don't, I like you guys, listen, you can go see a Star Wars. I don't <laughs> care, okay? But don't say it's one of the best board games ever created. Most overrated. Star Wars Rebellion. Easy money. If somebody wanted to play Star Wars Rebellion at a game night, though, Kellen, how would they say that? <laughs> yeah, they I would, want to play Star would... Wars Rebellion and make the story of Star Wars. <laughs> I think that's how you would say that. That's not, you're doing the Jar Jar Binks voice. I don't know why you think Jar, I was That's not a Jar Jar Binks voice. Yeah, never do listen, that. I f*** with the Gungans. You know what I mean? Like, I love the Phantom Menace video game, okay? Love it. Okay. I, you, You've made your feelings You're trading clear. around for pod racer parts, you know, and then you can f- kill people and steal them, and then Anakin's like, I don't want to help a murderer like you, and then you can't beat the game anymore. <laughs> Okay, that's not overrated. Phantom Menace, the video game. 
<laughs> All right. Let's move on. Listen, you think I angered them? <laughs> we'll find out. We'll find out soon enough. I think they're rational uh, people. Just get, yeah. Okay. The Star Wars fan. <laughs> All right, that's my first pick, Star Wars Rebellion 2016. <laughs> it's not a joke. <laughs> Next pick, Star Wars Imperial Assault. <laughs> yeah. You guys are just afraid to take the shot. <laughs> <laughs> it's you again, by the way, Kellen. No, I have to go twice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you going to make fun of now? <laughs> I was just sitting here in the silence. Well, there's a couple other darlings, <laughs> IP darlings. I want to do it. Okay. Mr. Tolkien, who is dead. <laughs> All right. That would be so amazing. I, just back to back Star Wars. And I can't. Things. I can't. I can't right now. But I, listen, listen. If nothing, if nothing, I am consistent. You know what I mean? Consistency mm-hmm. is key for me in my life. I have always said and will continue to say that the number five best board game of all time, Twilight Imperium 4th Edition, is nothing but a bunch of Daft Punk. Literally, I do not understand this game. It is like 12 hours long. It features everything you could want all in one board game box. There's my Gungan voice again. (laughs) But there are so many better games that do all of the things contained within Twilight Imperium. You've got arcs for some of this. You've got Cosmic Encounter for some of this. You've got Eclipse for some of this. Everyone who says, oh, I just love the negotiation you could do. You could be out of a game of Twilight Imperium in the first hour and then literally have to play it for 10 more hours. It is that sort of put everything in one game, I really love this game because it has everything in it. And if you don't like this game, it's because you don't understand it, man. But it's really, it just doesn't, it's not more than the sum of all of its stupid systems. I don't, I actually like legitimately don't get it. What, Mark? Oh, the stupid systems? I can't say stupid. I think it's a great idea to pick a game where there's a podcast based on just that game. There's a popular podcast whose only thing is talking about this game. So I think you're going to win. I think maybe a maybe people will vote with their hearts. You know what I mean? Uh, Instead yeah. of you, who apparently is like voting by committee over here, like <laughs> <an> hour. <laughs> this is this is nothing if not consistent. Twilight Imperium Fourth Edition. How did they oh, get no, to the Fourth consistent. Edition? I don't <laughs> know. No, I, I, I'm not doubting yeah, consistency. King, this is space back to back. You know what I mean? We're not fighting <laughs> over true. ice over here. That's true. Okay. That's true. Well, I'm I done. Gotcha. I'll stop talking. I think I'm out. This might could be my last episode. <laughs> After all these fandoms get at me, the space lions, they have novels for this. Okay. Do they really? That's wild. I think there is. I think they do. Yeah, I think they do. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. For my pick, I believe you. (laughs) Will you read the book? I'll read the book. Sure. If you. Oh, you're not willing? Yeah. Shut the (laughs) up then. I said I will read the book. If you win this, if you're not going to read read this book, and I'll I'll do a report on the book. In the next, if bonus I win episode. the draft, you'll read the book. I will read the book and I'll do a report on it in the in a subsequent yeah. bonus episode. You're so confident promise. that I've that angered promise. everyone. <laughs> okay, yeah, you can make any promise you want. <laughs> <laughs> For my pick, I'm going to dip outside the top 100, and I'm going to try to stop something from coming up into the top 100. I'm trying to look ahead now for the future. I'm, I'm doing this for the kids, not for us today, but for our children and grandchildren, trying to prevent this from going up. This game had a lot of hype, I think last year, maybe the year before, but I, I don't think it's worthy of it. And this is Earth. Earth is in the vein of Terraforming Mars and Arc Nova and those like you know tons of card games where you're building a tableau and firing off a lot of things. But I just think Earth is the least of that lot by some ways. A lot of the, the things you can do feel very samey to me, and I think it's also hurt by the color palette. I appreciate that it's like you know as Callan said, nature is lit, and they're trying to you know ride the coattails of that but it's a very you know brown and green color palette and so even the aesthetics don't really draw you in and just for all the hype it had and for like as epic as it's sort of felt with the name and you know the number of cards you could do it never really grabbed me no matter how many times i played it and so i think earth comes in currently at 191 but i'm just trying to slow that trajectory down a little bit so earth is my pick okay so i have two back to back here and i think i have to take couple of oh man i at least have to take one easy target here and that is going to be wingspan Ooh, wowzers all right i wasn't even gonna go that low that is pretty <laughs> low that is uh, pretty low i th- this you what? I, I don't know if this is a mistake based on our audience per se i just know that across 
almost any sphere of conversation I've ever had about board games. And this kind of extends, I think, to a large swath of Stonemaier's output. I think the delta, to use the word from earlier, between how we communally, as in the, as in the podcast, thinks about Wingspan versus its perception in the greater world of board games could not be larger. This is a game that you just cannot escape from in like almost any facet. This has levels of popularity growing be outside of hobbyist gaming to an absurd degree. And I'm not going to say that it's undeserved. It's obviously doing something right that appeals to those people, but that does not seem to correlate with almost anyone in the hobby that I talk to about their feelings on wingspan it is currently at number 29 on the top 100 which just feels incredibly high to me relative to what the game offers mechanically and strategically it's a funny conversation right because i won't defend wingspan obviously none of us particularly like it but in terms of like bringing new people into the hobby certainly super cool of course and the art is super cool so it's a little bit of like overrated to whom and then I also think that like the top 100, at least on BGG, is so heavily weighted towards heavier games that like I like Wingspan sort of saying, F- you like, you know, it doesn't have to be weight 3.0 and up. But again, we're grappling with the definition of our own list. So totally. I can't stop you from choosing what you want to choose. Uh, absolutely. And I think to some extent, like even that is me trying to wrap my head around what is going to be rewarded when you look at the word overrated. And this feels like a little bit of a swing that might be in the wrong direction. But I think for our audience, they're going to pick up what I'm putting down. They're going to eat up your manipulation. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Unlike the idiot who picked Earth. Then for my third pick, I am going to go with Seven Wonders Duel at number 19. This kind of is one of those ones where I'm a little bit uncertain because it is an older game. It is, you know, it is a 2015 game on this list, and that makes me think that it is probably on its way out of the list. But this is another one where I'm kind of hard pressed to find who the people are that are like mad excited about Seven Wonders Duel. I think it's a decent game. It's one that I've certainly had fun sort of showing non hobbyist gamers in the past because of its relative simplicity and sort of doing stuff that's like fairly novel. Kind of similar to the conversation we've just been having about Wingspan to some extent. But I just don't know that I know anyone who is excited about Seven Wonders Duel enough to justify it being in the top 20. So that's an interesting premise. You're saying that ultimately, like, everyone might be fine with Seven Wonders yeah. Duel. But it's like, no, there's no, this is my favorite. Absolutely. Film I, of all I, time. I don't think yeah. anyone would be it's like, fun. this is in my top 10 or anything yeah, like yeah. that, which I, you know, I don't think is certainly what the exercise is, but like that seems to like carry me. Yeah. me. I'm going to go with a game that feels sort of akin to my number one choice, Frosthaven, a game that came in hot, but I think has cooled down incredibly since then. And speaking of coming in hot, it was very flashy production. This is the number 75 game of all time, Mechs vs. Minions. A game I've played and I enjoyed. This is a game by Riot, you know, the video game publisher. It's a lavish, lavish production. Might have been produced at a loss. It's so lavish. And came to out to, to quite a bit of fanfare. It has, a, you know, an interesting, like, programming system to it. But, again, it's just a game where after that initial uproar, I, I don't hear any anybody talking about it anymore. And yeah, you know, if I'm going to play a programming game, I'd rather go with Robo Rally or something like that as opposed to Mex. I just don't don't hear Mex versus Minions ever suggested at, at a game night or people talking about it at all. So I'm going to go Mex versus Minions number seventy five. All right, I'm going to continue my quest to anger as many people as possible because that's what we're trying to do here. Neil and the Head Honcho and Mark the Entrepreneur are taking the coward's way out. I hope that the (laughs) voters will realize that. There is a type of game that is very popular in sort of aggregate, and I don't know how else to describe it beyond sort of saying, like, this is not the game, I'll get to the game, but the Ark Nova tableau builders of the world that Mark referenced with Earth, that can also be referenced with Terraforming Mars. But for me, the one that is the most overrated version of that would be Everdell coming in at the 36th ranked thing. And and contrary to what Neelan was sort of espousing, Everdell is is many people's favorite board game. I think it's many people's like favorite entryway into board gaming because they like Discworld, Morcoporpha. Is that right, Neelan? I, mean, I don't more. know how you're Got drawing it. that parallel, but sure. 
This is where the like the little animals that can talk. Yeah, it's not this. Not, not at all like this called Omokapo. Okay, what? It, but it's like isn't it like that other one Redwall. That's the same. Oh, right? that's the one. Redwall. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what I'm thinking of. Uh, anyway, not relevant, <laughs> but Everdell is totally fine. It's totally fine, but it's just that kind of tableau builder that everybody loves, that kind of tableau builder. But this one has the world's best artwork in it. And, you know, compared to Terraforming Mars, which has, you know, the world's best clip art of all time, Everdell is a lovely production with a literal 3D tree that comes up out of the table. And it's just sort of all a lot, but the game itself is sort of a little... It's fine. It's totally fine. It's totally fine. It is just not the 36th best board game of all time, but is also milked to death. You're getting Everdell, the seventh generation, Everdell, the Popperdell, the, you know, <laughs> Pearl Dell, Pearl, New Pearl Land, Everdell Complete Edition, now with two trees. Anyway, Everdell, <laughs> I think it's a... Well, <laughs> I don't know why you're laughing. This is real. I legitimately believe Everdell is one of the most overrated board games of all time. I just like the idea of two giant trees being part of a future version. Yeah, yeah. One on each side. Yeah. One per player so that everyone can equally <laughs> everyone be blocked their own giant tree. and be unable to see the tableaus uh-huh. on the table. Okay. I've kind of turned this list into just who can I piss off. And so that's going to lead to my next pick, the fourth most overrated board game of all time. This one defies description as a board game, in my opinion. It was made in the 1800s <laughs> um, in Canada, of all places, where nothing good has ever happened. Really? Right? Actually, it's a lovely place. I've been to Canada. <laughs> I love Canada. But I do not love Crokinole, the 47th best board game of all time. Like, what are we doing here, people? Wasn't this, this is your like, top 50? In I know. Oh, no, no, <laughs> Neil. Where is my Crokinole board right now? Me who invested hundreds of dollars in it. Where do you see that, Neil? That's do fair. you see it in my That's periphery? Fair. Mark, where is it? It's where is it? on my third floor. <laughs> it's on Mark's third floor. The game I spent the most money out of any board game ever. Board game, I say in quotes. This is like, this is like curling, okay? This is like people who come at you and say, my favorite sport is curling. Oh, my God. And you're like, Kellen, be careful what you're bit? saying. Are you is this a bit? <laughs> you're you're going to get so people mad at us. Why? You're For curling? People... Are you... Just take a shot of hockey while you're at it. <laughs> no, well, I mean, that one's so easy. So, <laughs> no, live hockey, that's fun to go to. That's okay, fun. no, no, no. It's I actually legitimately, when someone sort of defines Crokinole as... One of their favorite board games. Again, they can say that. They could say that. It's like, here's my top 10 board games and Crokinole, right? You know, uh-huh. like, does it exist in the list of your top 10? What do you think? <laughs> Episode Mark? 47, I urge everyone no, 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 to go no, to timestamp 1209. No, 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 no. Don't, don't do that. <laughs> don't put that in the show notes. Listen, listen. I was swept up in Crokinole too, but it's, it's, it's like... When you were a child, you thought as a child... It's like, no, it's like my favorite board game of all time is bocce ball. Like, <laughs> okay, so now we're going after the Italians. <laughs> no, then we're not going after anybody. <laughs> I love bocce ball. Bocce ball in the afternoon, Sunday afternoon. I love that. Okay. Get a get a nice coffee. Get a nice drink. Bocce ball in the afternoon. Not a board game. Okay. Crokinole. Okay. It has a rule about keeping your <laughs> on the chair. That's in the official tournament rule. The one cheek <clears throat> rule. That's one of the best rules of all time. What? You can't disagree with that. <laughs> yeah, that's a cool rule. I, all right. <laughs> Listen, it's not a... This is this is just my true feelings, okay? These are overrated games in the top 100. I'm being true to myself. It's okay to like Crokinole. I like Crokinole. I play Crokinole. Just, just... I don't know. Why? Like, why is it here? Like, it's a, it's a piece of wood. It's a parlor <laughs> game. <laughs> Anyway, that's my. I'm done. I don't know what I'm talking about. It's the Diet Coke. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Kellen has you know accused me of being a wimp, taking the coward's way out, uh, <laughs> and yet what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick a game that was on my initial top fifty that now I see as overrated. This is the 49th top game of all time according to this from one of my favorite designers. This is Caverna, the Cave Farmers by Uwe Rosenberg. 
I've just grown to believe that like, if you want the Rosenberg feeling, if you want the pastoral growing things and converting and all that stuff, you go with Agricola or you go with one of his newer things. You go with Newsfjord. You go with Feast for Odin. If you're looking for a looser Rosenberg, there are a lot of better ones than Caverna. If you want something like Caverna, you might as well just go whole hog and go Agricola, which is the far, far superior game. I just think Caverna falls in like a a gray zone that really doesn't serve any master. It's sort of just looser Agricola, and I, I just I don't think it's among his best, and certainly not the 49th best game of all time. So I'm sticking the dagger in myself here by going after a game that I once had in my top 50 of all time. Okay, my my fourth pick is a game that is a very successful Kickstarter, which I think it largely accounts for why it is this high. Uh, this is the number 99 game, Tainted Grail, The Fall of Avalon. I played all of this. Like This is a campaign that I played to completion from start to finish, and that's only because I'm a broken person and I got halfway and just couldn't bring myself to like not finish it. There are so many problems. There are so many design issues with this game front to back that I am shocked that it could even have gotten to this position on the list. I do think that this is a good textbook example of something accelerating up the charts purely on the basis of a ton of people backing it on Kickstarter. Not unlike what Mark had sort of said about Frosthaven, where it just had it had support baked into it from the get go. But I didn't. I think very few things are deserving of having like entered the ranks of the top 100 as much as Tainted Grail, which is so flawed almost from like the first episode despite the fact that i think that like some of the there are things i would praise about i think the writing is decent but so many of the design decisions just kind of felt really fundamentally flawed to the point that i was just like skipping through pages at the end of it just for the sake of saying hey i did this that's tainted grail for my number fourth pick Oh, God. For my fifth and final pick. There's one game I would prefer you don't pick. I'm really excited to talk to you guys at the end of this. My For my final pick, and I think that I'm probably going to make enemies with this one, but it's, it's one that I feel like... Come on in. Too clo- <laughs> yeah, I feel too clo- it's too close to my heart to not have it on a list, even if it's not necessarily going to do me any favors. But On Mars is a game that I cannot... I, I cannot express or articulate enough like how disappointed I am with like how much people rave about it. I think it is over-engineered to an absurd degree. I think that there are actually fundamentally big problems with the way that it handles its worker placement where, you know, in in the way that Kel in particular has often said about Lacerda designs, there are like five different ways to do one simple step and each of them sort of comes with different like sub rules and caveats. I don't understand how many people even in a world where i kind of quite like some of what lacerda does and very appreciate what he brings to the board game space i think on mars feels like three steps too far in the wrong direction of just complicated design for the sake of complicated design and not delivering enough on the back end of that to justify its rules grid which is a bummer because i think that it's a cool theme and a cool thematic idea that is just so so far off of the deep end of what a board game should be in terms of rules complexity okay so for my last pick i'm gonna follow kellen's lead here with his pick of twilight imperium and i'm gonna go with root no just kidding i'm not a <laughs> an idiot look a lot of these games even the ones i don't like as like the way i defended nemesis I-, I can see why they're up there even if i don't like them this one i just i feel like i'm this is gonna be wrong this is probably gonna be my worst pick but i just don't understand how this is among the top 30 games of all time, and specifically number 28, Lost Ruins of Arnak. I've played this game a number of times now. It's fine. It's totally fine. It just boggles my mind that this is a top game of all time. It's smooth. Worker placement, fine. I just have never played a game of it that felt exciting to me. You know, I know there are a number of expansions out, and maybe they fix things, or maybe make things more exciting is a better way of putting it, but it just has never struck me as a game that would be, as we've said in referencing other games on this list, as somebody's favorite game of all time. It's it's fine. I just don't understand how it's a top 30 game. So Lost Ruins of Arnak for me. I'm with you, Mark. I don't get this at all either, but people love it. I, I, don't, yeah. I don't understand why, but people do seem to love it. Yeah, I mean, I've never played it and thought it was broken or there's some issue with it. It's totally fine. It's just top 30 game is just, I think, speaking poorly of our hobby if that's top 30 game, but that's my opinion. You guys left the last pick to me. And let me just say to you, checkmate, Atheist. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> All right, with the last pick of the draft, I will select the game that is currently ranked 557th on the top like 1,000 board games of all time, Settlers of Catan. Oh, Boom. my 1995. God. 1995. What are you talking about? Settlers of Catan. This game is way overrated. You tell anyone, you tell anyone that you like <laughs> modern board games, and they say, oh, like Catan? No. No, dear <laughs> person. Not like Catan. Catan, listen, love Catan. Catan did a lot for us, right, in 1995, and we've moved on. But people still love this game. It has dozens of thousands of reviews, 130,000 reviews on Board Game Geek. It is, it is rated 7.1 on Board Game Geek. That is massively overrated. Oh, you rolled a 7. F*** you. Oh, you <laughs> didn't roll my number. I'm f- I can't win the game. That is Catan in a nutshell. You guys didn't... How did you not see this? It was right there in front of you. Klaus Tuber still warm in the grave when you're doing this. <laughs> Sad. When did he Sad. pass? Last year. When did he pass? How could Last you? week? Last year. Last year. <laughs> last year. Uh, Sad, listen, Sad. you guys didn't see it. You know, it was... For I good reason. The... For good reason. <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? For you... The game this... that, like, is the reason why we have a podcast is overrated? Are you kidding me? Mark, I thought about Uno. I thought about Monopoly. Okay. But I settled on Catan because it's terrible. It's not good. It's not a 7.1. Mark, you tell what do you have it ranked? I'm going to look at your BGG right now. You oh. obviously have this ranked. I probably have You're it gonna as a You're going to be six. like, "Oh, remember. Yeah, you probably have it as a 2." <laughs> okay. Listen. I don't know how to search for your name on here. <laughs> uh, what do I have it ranked as? I guess I haven't ranked it. I haven't given it a number. What? Oh, yeah. You're going to put it in a nine now, you <laughs> liar. <laughs> it could be anything. Don't lie. It could be anything. I <laughs> could be anything. All right. That is my last pick, Catan. I, listen, I, I stand by it. I okay. Think, I think you did hit on something, which, which is like, you know, I had the experience literally this weekend of talking to people about sure. like modern hobby board games, them sort of talking about having just played a lot of recent games of Catan, and I can't help yeah. but think in the back of my head like, why? Why is that the game that we're still playing in 2024? It's wildly popular. Yep. I, I, like, I, I, this isn't a troll pick, just to be clear. No, but no, I believe I'm you. happy for you to think that it's a troll pick. I actually, right, have a, so, I, actually, I actually do have it ranked as a five. <laughs> oh, so. so the Delta is 2.1. How's that for some <laughs> mental load? That's a huge <laughs> Delta, sir. All right. We're going to wrap this one up because I have said so many things that so many people aren't going to like. Your job now is to go to boardgamebarrage.com slash vote and you are voting for the list that contains the most however you want to define it most overrated games on it or the games that are the most overrated so you're not voting for your favorite games you're not voting for a collection of games that you want you are looking at our hypothesis most overrated board games looking at our list which i will say to you now if you want to vote for neelan neelan has nemesis wingspan seven wonders duel Tainted Grail, The Fall of Avalon, and On Mars. If you vote for Mark, you're voting for Frosthaven, Earth, Mechs vs. Minions, Caverna, The Cave Farmers, and Lost Ruins of Arnak. If you're voting for Kellen, you are voting for Star Wars Rebellion, Twilight Imperium 4th Edition, Everdell, Crokinol, and Catan, a.k.a. The Settlers of Catan. Cast your vote. You could win $100 at boardgamebarrage.com slash vote. That's going to do it for us today. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast. Thank you so much for uh, talking with us in the Discord. Feel free to reach out to us and tell us how much you love Jabba the Hutt. (laughs) Oh, Katan. Yeah, that's true. (laughs) One of many. Thank you to Heart Society Music for their song, What's on Your Mind, Kid, from their album, Wake the Queens. You can find us on all forms of social media at Twitter, a.k.a. X, at email aka gmail boardgamebarrage at gmail.com at boardgamebarrage.com at discord at boardgamebarrage.com slash discord you could chat with us thank you good evening and good night bye bye it's save you think I've cancelled the podcast Our own website to find out that we are on episode number 317. Anyone object to that? 
I, no one objects to that. <laughs> that is, in fact, the episode one. It is, in fact, the episode. It's also always is, the I, name of the studio for what it's worth. Oh, okay. Oh, my God. It always is this? Yeah. <laughs> but today it worked out? Wait, what? Uh, oh, 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 you're saying, sorry. Yes. I As thought in, you I were saying. I the name of the studio yeah, yeah. to that. Uh, I see. Yes. Yeah, I I thought you meant that for some strange unknown reason the studio was always always called three seventeen. But this today, was the one day that, yeah, 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 great. That would be cool. That would be cool. That would be cool. That would be That's cool. not true. <laughs> okay, let's clap. A lot to explain there. Three, two, one. That was a one, two, three. How do you do? <laughs> Why are you guys kneeling? Barcelona by Danny Garcia and published by Board and Dice. All right, anything for the mid cap? What is a mid cap? It's like a cap you wear on your head. Isn't it a part of an animal? Start cap. Isn't that like a cut of meat? The mid cap? Oh, I think there's a cap. There's something cap when it comes to I think there's just, something Isn't cap. that just literally like be, to differentiate it from like the end cap or the I, it's I a don't type think, of company? I don't think it's a word. Mid cap? Oh, yeah, mid cap like size, yeah. That's not what There's really ribeye either. cap steak. But it's not a mix. That's where it comes word. from. Well, it's it's just not a real word. Yeah. So, not a real word. I did, why did we start saying it? It's it what Kellen's like made up words. Word. No, what it's not. Oh, is this it's something Kellen? Yeah, this this up. has yeah. to be a Kellen thing. Yeah, that's exactly plus, right. Plus I didn't come up with mid cap. You, you must have. Where you you're, 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 you the are podcast. literally the person that comes up with all of the things we say. Nah, ah. Until like BG Bob. This is like textbook. Like years later, why do we say this word? Oh, because Kellen said it on episode two for no reason. Well, now I feel special. <laughs> Let's get right into... And finally, to Chris Herr, all the way in Mays Landing, New Jersey, a very happy 35th birthday from the entire BGB crew. Happy birthday, Chris. 